A fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Ohio silver. The Lone Ranger. Tuttle, the daring and resourceful masked rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Lone Silver, the Silver Coast, and Silver. The territory surrounding the town of Rimstone had for some time been terrorized by an outlaw gang, led by a man who had become known as the Faceless Bandit. This name had been given the outlaw leader because his head and features were completely covered by a black skin-tight covering seemingly improvised from a black cotton stocking in which two slits were cut for his eyes. The first appearance of the faceless bandit and the gang was when they held up a stage carrying a payroll from the Rimstone Bank to a mining settlement several miles away. Holy smoke, outlaws! Use your whip. I'm trying to use payroll and won't give up without a fight. Get up here! Get up, boys! Come on here! I'll give them some lead. Come on! the boss is pointing for. Get up there and get that payroll out of the strong. A short time later, the gang headed by the faceless bandit held up the Rimstone Express office just after night. Hey, what the... Oh, hold up, mister. Well, that hombre next to you, his head and face all black. He, he's faceless. Yeah, sure. And he's pointing at the safe. That means he wants you to open it pronto. Oh, no, I can't. Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah, the boss is signaling to make him hurry, Dave. Yeah. Better make it quick or the boss will fly. Here, wait. Uh, I'm hurrying. Yeah. Now, get busy, fellas. Yeah. Empty that safe pronto. Yeah, uh, you call boss. Just signals with his hands. He don't talk. Shut up. Oh. The boss is waiting for us to clear out fast. Come on, this way. <laughs> So it went. Ranchers who drew large sums from the bank in town were waylaid and robbed. A train that had left Rimstone with a gold shipment was robbed some miles away when it stopped at a water tower to take on water. A herd of prize horses disappeared soon after they arrived at a large spread outside of Rimstone. And always came the same report. 
It was the faceless bandit and his gang who did them. News of the gang had spread throughout the Southwest, and it reached the ears of the Lone Ranger and his Indian companion, Toto. Early one afternoon, they rode the trail through the hills, a few miles from Rimstone, accompanied by the Lone Ranger's nephew, Dan Reed. The masked man was saying, We'll make camp as soon as we get a little closer to Rimstone, Toto. Then we'll see what we can find out about the so-called faceless bandit in these gangs. Ah. Golly, how can anyone be faceless? Do you think he really hasn't <laughs> got a... <laughs> no, Dan. From what I've heard, I understand the gang leader wears what seems to be part of a black stocking pulled tightly over his head and face. That right. And then say him never wear a hat and have small holes and face covering to see through. Oh. Then say him never speak in direct gang by signal with hand. Yes, I know. Because of that, Toto, I'm almost convinced it's someone who's well known in Rimstone. You mean him not talk? Because him afraid someone no voice, Kimasabi? That's right. But what about the rest of the gang? If they're around town, someone might recognize one of them. Now, that's true. But I feel sure they aren't in town. The leader could go to meet them at some hideout whenever he has a job he wants done. Mm, that's right. From what I've heard, they go after shipments or people who are known to have something valuable. But always after they leave Rimstone. And that's what me here. I'd say that means there's a person in town who's in a position to know when someone's taking something of value out of Rimstone. Gosh, I wonder why the sheriff in Rimstone hasn't thought of that. Maybe he has, Dan. But there are two or three hundred people in that town. I didn't think of that. After we pitch camp, we make plans for getting a line on that gang. All right, let's move a little faster now. Come on, Silver. Come on, Victor. Come on, Victor. Meantime, in Rimstone, several men stood in a group around the sheriff, while two of them, Will Gorman, the banker, and Dave Gridley, the cafe owner, took turns prodding the lawman with sharp words about his lack of success in finding the outlaws. Seems to me, Sheriff, you should have been able to pick up the trail of that faceless bandit and his gang by now. Oh, sure. That's right, Sheriff. Getting so everybody around here is getting scared to move out of town with anything worth saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, first, Hunter, I'm doing the best I can. That hombre everybody's calling the faceless bandit is mighty smart. I could suspect most everyone in town and still be wrong. Well, maybe you could try to figure out who's out of town about the time the holdups take place. Will Gorman, for a banker, you talk like a fool. Folks are going in and out of town all day long. In fact, you were out of town the time that gold shipment was stolen from the tree. That's right, that's right, I was. I rode over to Stockton on business. <laughs> For that matter, I was out of town that day, too, remember? That's right, we did. Rode out to look over a spread I was thinking of buying. Well, for that matter, the sheriff himself was out of town on two occasions when that gang struck. Where'd you hide the stocking hood? Yes, sir. Why don't you own up? All right, go ahead and make fun all your legs. But it proves my point. You can't say an hombre's a faceless bandit just because he's out of town when things happen somewhere in the territory. Say, Sheriff, you reckon me and my partner will be safe heading out of here for Pecos in our prairie schooner? Well, if that be dry good-looking wagon down in front of the blacksmith shop is a schooner you mean, mister, it wouldn't get a second look from that outlaw again. Well, you can't go by look, Sheriff. we come a mighty long way in that wagon. Left a wagon train 20 miles east of you. Is that you? Why didn't you stay with the tree? My partner and me sold out a good business in St. Louis. We got a nice nest egg of cash, and we want to buy a spread west of the Pecos and stock up with cattle. What's the best route to take from here? Well, see, uh, head out the main trail at the west end of town. About uh, three miles from here, there's a fork in the trail. You take the one to the right. You mean to the left, Sheriff? No, no, it's to the right. No? Oh, you're right, Will. He does take the left forward. Well, thanks a lot. Reckon we better get started so as to make some distance this afternoon. So long. Yes, so long to you. Yeah, I reckon I better get back to the office. I've wasted enough time in here myself. So have I. I have work to do back at my desk. Yes, you old lady. Bye. The Lone Ranger, Toto, and Dan found a campsite just off the main trail, a short distance toward town from where the trail divided. 
Sometime later, the Lone Ranger and Tonto left the camp. They rode across the main trail and headed for a distant hill to check the vicinity for a possible gang hideout. A little later, Dan mounted his horse, Victor, and rode leisurely out to the main trail. He turned toward town and had gone only a short distance when he saw a weather-beaten prairie schooner coming around a bend ahead. One of the men on the driver's seat called out to him. Hey! Hey there, sir! Hi! Ho, Victor! Ho, ho! Ho, ho there! Ho, ho, ho! Sonny, we're supposed to be coming to a split in the trail somewhere along here. Well, that's right, sir. It's just a short distance ahead. Oh, I wasn't worried about finding it exactly. Oh? What we really want to know is which branch do we take to head for Pecos? I asked in town, but they got me confused by saying first one way and then the other. I'm sure you take the left branch trail, sir. Uh, the left. Uh -huh. Now that you mention it, they finally did decide it was left. <laughs> Thanks a lot, boy. <laughs> We'd have been sitting at that fork in the trail, scratching our heads in puzzlement, trying to guess which way. Great day. Look at coming over that rise off to the side. Yeah. Several men with bandanas covering their faces. Them outlaws would draw guns, Jed. Golly, the one in front. He's the faceless bandit. Uh-oh. I heard talk about him. Grab your rifle. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, please and hurry for your rifle. We got you covered. That means you two buttons. I'll get busy some of you men. Force the signaling to search the wagon. Uh, uh, no, look at here. We're just four pioneers. Shut up. We know you got plenty of cash with you. Hurry up, boys. Find that track. While some of the outlaws were searching the wagon, Dan Reed sat silently on the and held his hands high. Disregarding the other men after a quick glance, he studied the leader, whose head was entirely encased in a stocking-like covering. Careful training by the Lone Ranger and Toto had taught Dan to take into tales, and the boy quickly made a mental picture of the sinister, faceless bandit and of his horse. Finally, the outlaws came from the back of the wagon with a small canvas bag. Hey, looks like they found it, Chief. Go to work, fellas. Now throw your rifles down here, you two. Now, oh, wait a minute, mister. You got our cash, but without right. Oh, quick. I said. Sure, sure. Here's mine. Here's mine, too. Grab those rifles. Let's hit leather and get away from here. All right, come on. Hit leather. All right, let's go. Get off the trail back over that rise where they come from. By thunder, we're turning around and heading for the town to tell the sheriff. Better come along, son. No, you go ahead. I'm going to try and trail them. Come on, Big T. Hey, don't be loco. Come back. <laughs> For a short time, Dan managed to follow the outlaw's trail. Then he came to a wide, shallow creek where he pulled to a stop. Ho, ho, Victor, ho, ho, ho. We got a good start on this, fellas. We took to the water to cover that trail. Best thing to do is go back to camp and wait for the Lone Ranger and Tonto. Come on, Victor. Dan rode back to the camp and waited impatiently. It was over an hour later when the Lone Ranger and Tonto returned. Dan quickly told them what had happened. The Lone Ranger listened intently, then spoke. You were wise to come back and wait for us, Dan. Tonto and I saw what seemed to be a posse from a distance riding up the main trail. I guess the sheriff and his men are trying to trail the gang now. Isn't that right? I took a good look at the faceless bandit. He and the others had ordinary-looking bronks without any special markings on them. But I did notice one thing. Oh? What was that, then? Well, in the crease of his boots, where the sole joins the upper part, I noticed there was a fine dust. Sort of glittered in the sunlight, like gold dust. I noticed it on some of the others' boots, too. Hmm. Oh. Uh, what do you think of, Kimasabi? I'm thinking that Dan's quick sense of observation may help us spot that outlaw. How do that? I'm certain he's someone from Rimstone. If I'm right, that shiny dust Dan noticed on his boots will help us to capture the faceless bandit. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger adventure. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments.
to continue. A short time later, the Lone Ranger with Toto and Dan Reed rang to a halt in a secluded grove of cottonwoods near the edge of town. I'll wait here, Toto. You and Dan go on into town and look around. Ah. It'll be dark in another hour or so. If it's necessary for me to go into town, I can go then. Without drawing attention to my mask. All right, better get going. Ah. And if we find boots with shiny dust, we can back quick. Come, Dan. Get him up, Scott. Come on, Victor. Dan Reed and Toto left their horses at the hitch rack in front of the general store. Then they sauntered along the street, eyeing the boots on those who passed, and also on those who rode by. Finally, after arranging to meet in front of the general store where the horses waited, they separated. Toto went to the cafe. He stood at the back and observed everyone who entered. After he'd been there a short time, Dave Gridley, the owner, came from his back office and went to talk to the barkeep. Anyone been looking for me, Jack? No, not that I know of, Mr. Gridley. In fact, I didn't even know you were away from the cafe. I had something to attend to. Went out and came in the back way. I'll be back in the office if anyone wants to see me. Right. Uh, him have shiny gold-looking dust in crease of boots? Me go me damn, tell no ranger. Meantime, Dan Reed entered the general store and sat down, saying he was waiting for someone. His keen eyes looked over the boots of all who entered. Then banker Will Gorman came in. Howdy, Mr. Gorman. What can I do for you? I just came in from some tobacco, Hank. Well, uh, sure thing. There you are. Thanks. Put it on my account. Been out of town? I noticed you just rode up to the hitch rack out front and dismounted. Yes, yes I have, Hank. And Aubrey wanted to get a loan on a claim he has, so I went out to look it over. Be seeing you again soon. So long. So long. As soon as Will Gorman left the store, Dan Reed quickly left behind him and went to the hitch rack where Victor and Scout were waiting. He watched as Gorman walked up the street and went into the bank. Then Dan saw Toto coming toward him. Toto, I'm glad you didn't keep me waiting. Uh, we leave now, Dan. Go meet Lone Ranger. Not talk here. He's Stay a boy, you fella. Get him up, Scout. Come on, Victor. While Dan and Toto were in town, the Lone Ranger sat on a stump in the Cottonwood Grove as the great horse Silver grazed close by. Suddenly, Silver raised his massive head, then whinnied a warning. Instantly, the masked man jumped to his feet and whirled, making a grab for his guns. But even as he whirled, a voice spoke out sharply. What the... Hold it, mister. Don't draw up. The sheriff's voice came from behind him and a short distance away. Please, can't be quick about it. The sheriff had stepped from behind a tree. And after he got the drop on the masked man, six members of his posse showed themselves. The sheriff spoke again. We got tipped off by a fellow who saw you turn in here with two others. Where are they? In town. In town, man. Eh? You and them must be part of the gang we were hunting. Eastwise, that mask proves you're not on. I can explain my mask, Sheriff. As a matter of fact, in regard to the gang... Shut up. Try... I'm in no mood to listen to phony explanations. Now that I'm standing in front of them, the rest of you get together behind him. Now what, Sheriff? You'll find out what before we're through. Everyone in that faceless bandit's gang will hang for the killings that took place. We're taking you into Rimstone Jail. You'll hang anyway, so you might as well talk and let the others hang with you. Sheriff, does a silver bullet mean anything to you? You mean you'll have a silver bullet? Yes, Keep I'll reaching be... there. I reckon you have a silver bullet, all right. But if it was made of gold, it wouldn't mean any more than the fact that you stole it from someone who got it as a trophy for shooting or something. All right, boys, keep them covered careful, Act. I'm going to holster my gun and then take those fancy ones he's got. After that, we'll take off that mask. Watch out, Sheriff. Get him from the side so he can't grab you. Don't worry. With five of you bunched together behind him with drawn guns, he won't dare flicker an eyelash. All right, mister. I'll holster my gun and take yours. One little move, and you'll get a hail of bullets from behind you. As the sheriff stepped cautiously to the side of it and then moved in toward the Lone Ranger, the masked man took a quick glance backward. He saw that the intelligent stallion Silver was tensed and ready for quick action. Even as the Lone Ranger spoke sharply, Silver sprang into action. Oh, Silver! <laughs> 
silvery streak of lightning, Silver rushed into the group of men holding guns, pulling them over right and left. And as the sheriff's attention was momentarily attracted by the commotion, the Lone Ranger drew one of his own guns and reaching with the other hand, grabbed the sheriff's gun from its holster. What about fair play, Sheriff? Now you're covered. Stand and stand him, somebody. I dropped my gun. All right, but I'll get it now. You not use guns. Reach Hey, the Indian with two guns. Yeah, and all of us knocked to the ground. The masked man has two guns, too. Otto, I'll keep them covered. You go pick up their guns and toss them into the bushes. Uh, you use one hand. Keep gun ready another. Quickly, Tonto got the guns from the men of the posse and tossed each one into the thick bushes off to one side. Then the Lone Ranger flung the sheriff's gun. There's your gun, too, Sheriff. You and your men can hunt around in those bushes for them later. Hey, Cinder, you regret this, mister. We'll, we'll get our horses and take after you. We see horses and let you go. Know something wrong. The untie horses. Send them galloping along trail away from town. But that's... Holy smoke, we'll have to round up our horses. These all hoots don't decide to cut us down. We're not outlaws, so you're safe, Sheriff. Damn, wait and let you grow. Good. Here's Silver. I'm Scout. Easy, steady, big Oh, Scout. Come on. Adios, Sheriff. See you again sometime. All right, Cupid around. Hey, Silver. Hey, the Lone Ranger and Toto met Dan on the edge of town, and they cleverly covered their trail back to the camp. Toto reported the cafe owner, Gridley, had glittering dust on his boots. Dan reported he had seen the same kind of dust on the boots of the banker, Gorman. The Lone Ranger detailed a plan to bring the gang leader into the open. Then they rode back toward town. Later, Dave Gridley sat at his desk in his office at the cafe. Hearing a knock at the back door, he got up and, with a gun in hand, went to open it. Oh. An Indian holding a kid by the arm. What's the idea? Uh, you not need gun. Me bring note to friend. Here. Here, no. You let me you go. Stand you stand still. You not get away. I guess it's safe to host him my gun while I read this. Dear boss, you can trust the redskin. The button was caught snooping at our place. I told the redskin you'd pay him off for bringing the button to you. Signed, Jeff. Hey, who printed this note? Who's Jeff? What kind of trick is this, anyway? Well, him say you remember boy, and you pay plenty cash. Give me bring him here. All right, Thunder, there's something funny here. Step aside, kid, and I'll show you what I'm going to do. Dan jumped aside as Tonto sprang at Gridley, landing a hard blow to the chin. Quickly, Tonto and Dan ran into the shadows nearby, followed by the lone ranger who had been standing to one side just outside the door. They stopped and looked back at the open door. He's getting up. Look, he's coming out. Him run between buildings. Toward Crown. Maybe going for his horse at the hitch rack. Come on. <laughs> Look, King McCubby. Him run past horses. Go across to Sheriff's office. He's a man we want. He's clever. Let's finish our plan. <laughs> time later, Will Gorman, the banker, was given a similar note. He read it, then said... Boy, snoopers like you always get hurt. Bring him over to my desk and hold on to him, and I'll give you some cash. As Gorman opened the top drawer of the desk, Tonto leaned forward and looked at its contents. He saw, among others, one item that was of great interest, a black stocking mask. Gorman looked up and saw him staring, just as Dan blurted out... Hey, there's a canvas bag stolen from the Pioneers today. He's the faceless bandit. As Dan spoke, Tonto, in a lightning-like move, shoved the boy down in front of the desk. Down there. At the same time, pulling his gun. But a gun was already in Gorman's hand as he withdrew it from the drawer. I'll kill you and him, too, in the end. Oh, I'm hit. Someone shot through the window. There they are, Sheriff. All right, reach in. in. You too, son. You got some explaining to do. Hey, Sheriff. That's the same red skin that dropped the masked man trick us a while ago. Hey, so he is. No, we're getting somewhere. Uh, you wait. No, Pam, this week. Yes, you will wait, Sheriff. And listen this time. Mask man again with two guns leveled at him. Holding these guns going to keep anyone from making a foolish move. Otto, what about this man, Gorman? If Sheriff look in desk drawer and find Black Hood, a faceless bandit. Yes, and he'll find a canvas bag of money stolen from the pioneers today. Yes, we should. It's just like they said. But Will Gorman... He can't be the faceless bandit. He can be, and he is. Sheriff, here's a letter from the Pecos Marshal sent to a padre friend of mine, huh? asking him to get my help in hunting this outlaw. Great day, this is... 
Will you get the masked man known as the... Holy catch! That's what you meant by speaking of a silver bullet, eh? Yes, sir. But what led you to Gorman? There's a glittering dust in the crease of his boot near the sole. This boy noticed it today when the pioneers were held up. Then you're the brave lad the pioneer told about. The one who went to trail them outlaws. I guess so, sir. We spotted two men in town with that dust on their boots. Ridley and Gorman. So that's why they came to me, huh? <laughs> a shaky old prospector opened a pouch of gold us today in the cafe and spilled some of it on my boot. You can't pin this on me. Anyone could have planted that hooding things in my oh, head. Wait a minute, wait I, I recollect a couple of old prospectors who dug for months into the side of a hill thinking they'd made a strike. They got a regular cave, and all they got was fool's gold. They threw the dust all over that cave in disgust. That must be the gang's hideout, then. Yep. It explains the glittering dust on Gorman's boots. Hunter and I'll help you round up those outlaws after well, you... you did your job grabbing the important one, mister. We'll stick Gorman, the faceless bandit, in the jail. Then I'll take a big posse and grab the others without much trouble. They won't be expecting anything. We owe you an apology for what happened. Oh, forget it, Sheriff. We'll be nearby until we hear you caught the gang. Let's get back to camp, Hollow. Come, Dan. Well, them three sure face down, the faceless bandit, there, boys. <laughs> get Gorman out of here along with the evidence, and we'll grab the others. They'll squeal on one another like a litter of peas. Look, Sheriff, eh? why did you change toward that masked man like you did? Who is he, anyway? Well, I wondered why he didn't gun some of us late this afternoon when he turned the tables on us. But now I know... You see, he's the Lone Ranger. Feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated, created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Charles D. Livingston, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of the Lone